impeachment trial. Why some senators question the case against former President Donald Trump. American Rescue Plan. How President Joe Biden is working with business leaders to promote his proposal. Papal trip to Iraq. Learn more about Pope Francis's upcoming journey in our report from Rome. And New York Encounter. The papal representative to the U.S. discusses the annual event virtually taking place this weekend. On EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, February 9th, 2021. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm Tracy Sable. History on Capitol Hill today, the start of the second Senate impeachment trial against former President Donald Trump. The high stakes battle comes after both sides of the aisle agree to a speedy process in the Senate. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales joins us now with more. Eric. That's right, Tracy. It is history in the making. You know, senators are doing something that they've never done before. That is consider articles of impeachment against a former president. The charge, incitement of insurrection. And after a very powerful opening statement and also a video taking place of the events uh, on January 6th, then senators then dis decided to debate and continue to debate on whether or not to continue the trial. Before any testimony is heard detailing the deadly insurrection of the Capitol last month and if then President Donald Trump enticed it, lawmakers must decide whether they constitutionally have the right to bring impeachment charges against a former president. Our case is based on cold, hard facts. The Senate has a solemn responsibility to try and hold Donald Trump accountable for the most serious charges ever, ever levied against a president. The Democrats' case will rely heavily on video and court filings of charged insurrectionists claiming that they were taking their cues from President Trump. We fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. President Trump's attorneys downplaying those remarks, writing in their brief, quote, of the over 10,000 words spoken, Mr. Trump used the word fight a little more than a handful of times, and each time in the figurative sense that has long been accepted in public discourse. They believe since former President Trump is no longer in office, the hearings shouldn't move forward. Republicans I spoke with agree. It's an unconstitutional impeachment because um, the former president is a private citizen at this point, uh, and it would set a horrible precedent. There are so many things that our constituents expect us to be doing, and I see this being used as a, a political vengeance tool. After a vote takes place on whether or not they can constitutionally continue, if they do decide continue, each side will have 16 hours to present their case, and after that, witnesses will present their testimony. It is not expected that President Trump will present any testimony under oath. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Well, Vince Colonnais, editorial director at The Daily Caller, joins me now on Skype. Vince, welcome back. Always great to speak with you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Front and center today, of course, is the issue of whether this impeachment trial of former President Trump is, con is constitutional, that is. Uh, having heard the arguments from both sides, what are your thoughts on this, Vince? Well, this is obviously a, a big deal. Look, let me just stipulate at the beginning of this, we know how this conversation ends. Democrats control the Senate, so therefore they are going to move ahead uh, today by saying, look, this trial is constitutional. It can move forward. But the big game here is for the Republican side of the aisle, or at least Donald Trump's lawyers, to convince the Republicans inside the Senate not to support the Democrat effort to convict the president. And, one, and they're doing that in two ways. One, they're arguing uh, the merits of the case itself, suggesting that President Trump did not incite violence. In fact, he called on the supporters that were there on January 6th to peacefully and patriotically make their voices heard. That was one of the quotes from his speech. Uh, additionally, they're going to argue about the constitutionality of this, as you're talking about. They're going to point out that the Constitution's prescription for impeachment and conviction is built specifically to going to going after current office holders. That is not the state of affairs we find ourselves in today. This is about the former president of the United States. 
Uh, and one of the other our other arguments that Trump's lawyers are making is that by using the power of the Senate to punish a private citizen, that also runs afoul of another constitutional provision called a bill of attainder. No bills of attainder may be passed by the Constitution, which is another way of saying nobody can be punished by the legislature in America. That has to be done in a court of law. Yeah, Vince, I don't know if you saw this or not, but uh, Republican lawyer Charles Cooper in a Wall Street Journal opinion piece wrote this uh, in part, quote, given that the Constitution permits the Senate to impose the penalty of permanent disqualification only on former office holders, it defies logic to suggest that the Senate is prohibited from trying and convicting former office holders. Uh, what do you think on that about that? Do you think that's a valid point? I think it's a valid part of a robust debate going on right now in the legal community. There is definitely no settled opinion on this. His opinion uh, clearly considered uh, authoritative among uh, many. Uh, but the other side of this is Judge Michael Luddig, who is a conservative jurist who's come out and said, no, this is unconstitutional. And the reason is because he's not a sitting president of the United States. So if the impeachment itself is unconstitutional, the sentences, by extension, would also be unconstitutional. Uh, again, it's a robust debate. We know how it settles, though, at least today. Uh, Democrats are going to move forward with it anyway. The real challenge will be on the constitutional question is if President Trump ever decides to run for office again in the future, should he be convicted in this Senate trial? Then that would start a chain of cases that could get up to the Supreme Court about what the Senate is doing right now and whether or not it was ever constitutional to begin with. Yeah, Vince, we don't have a lot of time left, but I want to talk about this. Someone who's not there today is Chief Justice John Roberts. Let's talk about that. Your thoughts? Well, this goes right to the points we were just talking about. The, the Chief Justice is the official that's supposed to be uh, presiding over a trial of the President of the United States. That, that's in the Constitution. The Chief Justice is to preside over an impeachment of the President. This is not the President. This is the former president of the United States. And I expect what's going to happen today is that the president's lawyers are going to point this out as a way to assist their argument, to say, look, the Constitution is really clear about the arrangement for how we impeach a president, and the chief justice is supposed to be a part of it. And if you're telling us right now that the chief justice is, is, is optional right now, whether he's here, that kind of gives the game away. We are not impeaching a current president of the United States. All right, Vince, we're going to leave it right there. I am sure we're going to talk to you uh, pretty soon about this. Vince Colonnais, editorial director at The Daily Caller. Thank you again, Vince. Always appreciate your analysis. Thank you. Very good to be here. Our President Joe Biden meets with major companies like Walmart, Lowe's, and J.P. Morgan Chase to push for passage of his $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan. His administration is also unveiling a new initiative to send COVID-19 vaccines directly to community health centers. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. Today, President Joe Biden invited business leaders to the White House to talk about the state of the economy, his recovery package, and the minimum wage, as well as get their feedback on his plan to help the country get back on its feet. We got millions of people unemployed. At the White House, along with Vice President Kamala Harris and Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, President Joe Biden talks business, working to convince industry executives his plan is needed right now. American people are hurting because a lot of people are in real, real trouble. A lot of people going to bed at night, staring at the ceiling, wondering whether they're going to be in that apartment the next day. They're going to be evicted or they're going to keep their mortgage payment up. Uh, they're going to have any health insurance. For $1.9 trillion, a growing pile of debt and worries over inflation. Qualifying Americans get in return direct cash payments to those who meet income requirements, more generous tax breaks for families with kids, and a strengthening of unemployment benefits. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki says it's important to get more money sent out quickly. The president and the administration are making the case directly to the country about the need to pass the rescue plan so we can finish the job and get $2,000 into the pockets of working families so we can reopen schools safely and so we can get economic relief to struggling Americans and communities. Meanwhile, the White House COVID-19 response team announced a new plan to turn community health centers into vaccination sites. They believe it will help with health equity since many of the centers work in underserved neighborhoods. So this includes people who are experiencing homelessness, you know, agricultural and migrant workers, residents of public housing, 
and those with limited English proficiency. We're also learning tonight that President Biden will be traveling to Milwaukee, Wisconsin next Tuesday for a CNN town hall. You'll recall that President Biden won Wisconsin in November by a narrow margin. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Officials in the United Kingdom announced stricter travel restrictions due to the coronavirus pandemic. Every passenger must demonstrate a negative test result 72 hours before they travel to the UK. And every passenger must quarantine for 10 days. Arriving in this country involves a two-week process for all. Health Secretary Matt Hancock says the measure may prevent new variants of COVID-19 from entering the country. It includes a 10-year prison sentence for those who attempt to hide traveling from three dozen countries where there are concerns over the new variants. Currently, it is illegal for British citizens to travel abroad for anything other than work. Lawmakers in the European Union are debating the new pro-life measure in Poland. Die Polen wollen Ehe, Familie und das Menschenrecht auf Leben schützen. One member of the EU Parliament from Germany applauds the law. He says protecting the right to life is one of Europe's most fundamental values. But other lawmakers lashed out at the new law, saying that it is a violation of the rights of women. At least 31 people are dead and dozens of others missing following a devastating flood in northern India. Rescue workers are searching for survivors. We always hope for the best and uh, we, will, uh, we will be very happy and uh, if uh, God helps us. One of the rescue efforts is focused on a tunnel at a power plant. That's where more than three dozen workers have been out of contact since Sunday. The disaster was set off after a part of a glacier snapped off a mountain, triggering flooding and mudslides. Bishops in Colombia mark the fourth anniversary of the kidnapping of a Catholic religious sister. Sister Gloria Cecilia Navarez was abducted while in Mali. Authorities believe that she was kidnapped by a branch of Al-Qaeda. The bishops asked the faithful to join them in praying for her release. Coming up, free to worship. A California archbishop offers reaction to the Supreme Court order allowing churches to reopen. Calling it, quote, a very significant step forward for basic rights, the Archbishop of San Francisco responds to the Supreme Court's decision striking down California's ban on indoor worship. The 6-3 to three decision by the high court allows the state to limit attendance to 25% of a building's capacity. It also keeps restrictions on singing and chanting in place. Archbishop Salvatore Cordiglione of the Archdiocese of San Francisco joins me now on Skype to talk more about the significance of this ruling. Your Excellency, welcome back. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Uh, tell us, what does this decision allowing indoor worship in California, what does it represent for Catholics? And personally, what does it mean for you? It represents for all people of faith that the First Amendment of the Constitution matters and that the right to religious freedom cannot be curtailed. And worship is the most basic part of that. Religious freedom means many things, but worship is at the heart of it. And the state cannot uh, intrude on our right to worship, although we must do safely and we can do so safely. So for Catholics, this is a, a, a wonderful news that we can, we can continue to worship and now we can be inside of church without worrying about government harassing us for worshiping, up, worshiping inside of church because obviously as Catholics, we can't really worship live stream. That's it's kind of a makeshift substitute, but it could only be temporary. You cannot live stream the sacraments. You cannot receive them virtually. So this is very critical for us as Catholics and for all Christians. I mean, the church is, means literally an assembly. Ecclesia is an assembly of people gathered together. This is our identity as Christians being gathered together as members of the body of Christ. So this is a, an acknowledgement that our right uh, to worship cannot be curtailed. It does have to be regulated, and we accept the necessity for uh, certain restrictions to observe safety protocols to uh, ensure public health. But we can do it in a safe way, and we shall. And I'm curious, what's been the reaction from your flock? What have people been saying? 
I've received much uh, uh, thanks, uh, much uh, appreciation and, and happiness uh, from uh, people here in the Archdiocese. Uh, people are very happy to be able to return to worship inside. I had already given my priest permission to go inside before Christmas uh, when I saw the direction the court decisions were going. And I've been insisting all along, the state does not have the right to tell us we can't worship. It has the right to tell us what we have to do to keep people safe, but those restrictions cannot be so severe as to effectively ban public worship. I ask the priest to continue to celebrate mass outdoors whenever possible, but if it's safer for the people to be indoors, than to take them indoors because we can do it safely indoors as well. Outdoors as, as an extra safety precaution. So this is why I say we can now uh, worship indoors, but we have the uh, court decision that uh, protects us from government harassment. But again, we must do so safely. Uh, as you know, uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch wrote in part in his opinion, quote, if Hollywood may host a studio audience or film, uh, a singing competition, while not a single soul may enter California's churches, synagogues, and mosques, something has gone seriously awry. I'd like to get your thoughts on that, and what do you think the Supreme Court's decision signals to government officials in California? It signals that they must treat religion at least equally to secular activities. Now, I know there's this debate about what is what is worship comparable to? What type of secular activity? And I know in this dissenting opinion, they uh, they took the position that uh, people going into a store there briefly and they leave. That happens sometimes. It doesn't happen all the time. So it's it's a very complex thing. The the example of our of a large cathedral such as St. Mary's here here in San Francisco, it is large and cavernous. We could have hundreds of people in there and make sure that they're safe. That's different from a smaller church, say, with a, a low ceiling without many windows for ventilation. So it's much more complex than some kind of a simplistic solution. Uh, but, but the insistence that we be treated uh, at least equally as uh, favored secular activities is, I think, at what is at the heart of this decision. And we have not been treated that way. I'd like something else very much that uh, Justice Gorsuch said in his decision when I think he hit the nail on the head in terms of how uh, uh, faith communities have been treated because they keep saying we're going to open up and, and then, then we don't or they, they step back. He said government actors have been moving the goalposts on pandemic related services, sacrifices for months, uh, adopting new benchmarks that always seem to put restoration of liberty just around the corner, but it never quite comes. Uh, so we're grateful that we're being treated equally as others. Indeed. Well, thank you so much, Your Excellency, for coming on. We really appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Up next, report from Rome. Colin Flynn joins us to reveal new details about the Pope's trip to Iraq. And the Pope's representative to the U.S., Archbishop Christophe Pierre talks about the upcoming New York Encounter event. Well, the Vatican has released Pope Francis' schedule of his upcoming trip to Iraq. The Holy Father will meet a top Muslim religious leader and visit Christian communities that were forced to flee due to ISIS attacks. Joining us now is EWTN News Rome correspondent Colin Flynn. Colin will be flying with the Pope to Iraq and can give us more details. Colin, good to see you as always. Uh, tell us what's on the agenda for the Pope's trip in March. Good evening, Tracy, from the Eternal City. Well, the Holy Father will leave Rome for Baghdad on March the 5th. And like all apostolic trips, he will receive a welcoming ceremony upon arrival at the presidential palace in Baghdad. Followed by that, he will meet the president, Baram Saleh, and other government officials. He will then meet with Catholic priests and religious at the Syro Catholic Cathedral in Baghdad, the capital. The next day, he will travel to Najah, just south of Baghdad, to meet the Iraqi Muslim leader Ali al Sistini. He will also host an interfaith meeting at the Plain of Ur. That's the ancient city known to be the birthplace of Abraham, who, of course, is considered to be the patriarch of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. 
Then on March the 7th, the Holy Father will travel north to Erbil and Mosul along the Nineveh Plain, known as the Cradle of Christianity in the Middle East. There, Christian communities were taken over by ISIS, especially from 2014 to 2016, causing many Christians to flee the region. Now, the Pope will take a special moment of prayer for those victims of war and will also visit a local Christian community at the cathedral in Bakdia, which it was charred black after the Islamic State set it on fire when they took control of the city in 2014. Pope Francis will conclude his three-day trip with Mass at a stadium in Erbil and then return to the Eternal City on March the 8th. Colm, uh, tell us a little bit more about the Muslim leader that the Holy Father is going to be meeting with. Uh, who exactly is he and why is this important? Yes, Tracy, well, the Pope will meet Iraqi's Muslim top spiritual leader, Ali al-Sistini. He is 90 years of age and he's become one of the most heard and influential voices in Iraq, but also in the Islamic community. And according, according to Cardinal Sacco, he is the head of the Chaldean Catholic Church in Iraq, the two together will release a joint declaration against all those who attack life. And we are looking forward to that. Thank you so much. Colin Flynn, EWTN Newsroom correspondent. Thanks again, Colin. Thank you, Tracy. And finally tonight, an annual faith-based event in New York City is taking place this year despite the coronavirus pandemic. 2021 New York Encounter fe features three days of virtual discussions and special exhibits. This year's theme is When Reality Hits. It examines at how the pandemic and other events of the past year have changed us and why there is hope for the future. Joining us now is one of the speakers this year, Archbishop Christophe Pierre, the Apostolic Nuncio to the United States. Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your time. Um, I know that you've participated in New York Encounter several times over the years. What can you tell us about the event? Well, I think it's a, it's a quite a meaningful event, uh, which link, is linked with a kind of experience in the church. You know, it's... Uh, it's a convocation made by a, by a group of friends who belong to a movement which is quite well known in the church called Communion and Liberation. And uh, as you know, this, uh, this group, this movement was founded more than 50 years ago by uh, an Italian priest co called Monsignor Giussani. Uh, one, uh, Monsignor Giussani was a professor, an intellectual, but one day uh, while uh, traveling in a train, he met with a group of young people. And he was hit by the reality of these young people. You know, they were all Catholics, all Christians, but in the, in the conversation with them, he realized that uh, their life was disconnected with their faith. And uh, he changes this event, changed his life. And instead of continuing to be a professor of university to make him some research, he decided to to become a kind of chaplain in a, in a high school. And from that, uh, he had a, quite a new experience. He made disciples and helped these young people precisely to, to make a personal encounter with Christ, but to connect their faith with their reality of young people. So now we have uh, thousands of, of uh, young and old people <laughs> who belong to this movement. And every year, they. They organized this uh, this event, which is a kind of encounter, uh, much in line with uh, uh, the culture of encounter, which you know it has been developed by the Pope Francis. So I I, I have my sympathy myself for these people, and uh, usually I participate with many others. The theme today is quite interesting. You know, it, when how the reality hits ourselves, you know, we have all been touched with the, the reality of this pandemic which had changed our life, how do we react in front of this reality? Well, you had just mentioned that the theme of this year's event. Can you talk a little bit more uh, about that, responding to, to the pandemic, and what you hope people will take away from the event? Well, I think uh, the, the important, uh, as I have experienced it, you know, in the, during the last few years, is that these people come to, to, to have an encounter, you know, they, to have an encounter within themselves, but also to, to have an encounter with God. 
And what they find, and I hope they will find it during this very special encounter, which it will be through, you know, uh, through Zoom and all all these uh, instruments. But uh, you know, they uh, we we are all invited to 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 uh, to experience who we are, you know, uh, and to reflect upon our our strong desires, our aspiration, and uh, to 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 try to make this strong aspiration in our humanity to correspond with uh, with uh, Christ himself and to to realize through uh, the encounter with others through an experience of encounter uh, how uh, the the encounter with Christ corresponds to the to to what we we want to be deep down yeah, and to change our humanity so this is what and uh, we we have all experienced during this year, you know, a kind of uh, uh, difficulty to live, you know, uh, difficulty to to find the meaning to have life. Uh, we have there is a kind of uh, disappointment about life, so we we really need to to find a new hope, and uh, I, I think it's important in order to find it to to exchange to have to have this encounter with others. This is what I expect, and if you look at the program, you know, we will have uh, a huge number of people intervening, but they all go in that direction, kind of reflection about the reality, but uh, always open to, to the research of the meaning. What does my life mean for me and uh, in relation with, with others? Mm. Well, Your Excellency, thank you so much for your time today, and thank you for coming on and talking about this very important event. We appreciate it. Thank you. And we thank you for watching tonight. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.